Well, praise the Lord, everybody. Welcome to Christian Life Broadcast, a ministry of Christian Life Center right here in beautiful and super cool, actually, for the past few days, Palm Coast, Florida, 5200 Belterra Parkway. We are so delighted to bring another episode to you. Thank you for joining us. If this is your first time tuning in, thank you for taking the time to check out what's going on here. And uh, for those of you that are coming back for more, God bless you. We're thankful that you are being continually blessed. And, um, boy, I have to give God some praise for last night's service. Wednesday night's service was just, um, it was so good. The flow of the Spirit has just been taken over almost every service. And uh, we're having to sort of um, go with it and also manage it so the Word of God can go forth. And it's a fine line to to kind of... Uh, navigate because we want the flow to take over, but also we need the word of God to go forth. And boy, what a wonderful challenge to have, to have that option. And our young people are just so going after it, laying out on the platform after singing their youth choir songs. And uh, I, I'm just here to testify that the Christian life is the best life. There's no greater life. There's no greater fulfillment. I was speaking to an elderly gentleman today, uh, early this morning, and he was telling me, how he has spent his life living for himself. And he is not a, he's not a Christian. He doesn't know the truth. He spent his life living for himself and has no family, no wife, no kids, no grandkids. And he looked at me, he said, I know, I know you're a pastor. He said, have I, have I messed up? Have I lived my life in vain? And <clears throat> I tell you, the Holy Ghost came on me and I began to tell him boldly, I said, said, sir, when you, when you have the spirit of God flowing through your spirit, flowing through your body, flowing in your life, and you have Jesus Christ approval, there is no greater fulfillment that this life can offer. And uh, his eyes began to water. He started kind of breathing, trying to control his emotions. And, I, and I, I, the Holy Ghost was in that moment. And there's another gentleman standing there. They don't know anything about Pentecost or the Spirit or the gifts of the Spirit or anything that I, I'm aware of. And um, God began to work with this man in a profound way. And, and you know, he's got, he's got money, beautiful properties. Um, he's lived a good life and yet empty. But when you have the Holy Ghost... You might not have the same level of money, the same level of, of economic advancement, maybe the same party life, but man, there's a fulfillment that comes that nothing else can match. And that's the Christian life. And I, I encourage you to try it and give it all you've got. It'll be worth it. Today, I, I really have a quick thought, something that's sort of been burning in my spirit um, that I want to relay to you Um. And I, I don't know how long it's going to be. It, it literally may be an hour or it may be 15 minutes. We're going to see. But um, I'm just going to go with kind of what flow I'm feeling today. And I want to present it in the form of a question to you um, and, and, and sort of come against a voice that has spoken to me for a very long time and probably to others that want to be apostolic, Pentecostal, and to have everything the Bible has to offer. And it's a spirit of intimidation. It's a spirit that wants to sort of water everything down and put us all into one religious, workable mold. That way there is no fanaticism. And the question I, I, I want to present today, I feel like sums up this spirit, is are, are we too Pentecostal? Are we too Pentecostal? Are we a little too much for the world? And uh, I want to address that today <clears throat> and give you some historical points, some spiritual experiences, and also some biblical things. I, I think... The spirit of intimidation began to come to me when I was a very young man. I would, I would, uh, I was very bound socially. Uh, I was extremely bound socially. I would have been, in my opinion, looking back, 
and knowing what I know now, I think I would have been diagnosed with some sort of social disorder. Um, I, I had major physical problems if I got in public, major physical problems uh, going to church, going to uh, especially like a camp meeting, a more public venue where I'm not in my familiar surroundings with familiar people. I would get sick to my stomach, um, uh, sweaty palms, anxiety out the roof. My blood pressure would rise, couldn't think, couldn't focus, couldn't talk. Dealt with this, this spirit of intimidation, insecurity, intimidation, fear for, for, for several decades. And <clears throat> I remember uh, as a young man, as a teenager, um, people trying to help me with this and, and trying to get me out of this um, and it, it was a journey for me. It was a tremendous journey. And I started praying a lot as a teenager. God brought me into prayer and, and, uh, began to fast and pray. And especially when I was loosed, really loosed from bondage at 21, spiritual, physical, emotional, mental bondage in a profound way. I think I told that in the, in the testimony of, um, generational curses, but in that episode. But once I, once I hit that, that freedom, the Lord really began to put it in my heart to evangelize. And when I say evangelize, I mean, witness to people, tell people about Jesus, uh, get converts, disciple people. And it was a, it was a profound challenge because I, I loved prayer. I loved prayer. I loved getting into the prayer room. I loved fasting. I, when I say I love fasting, I, I do need to qualify that. I didn't like going without food, but I love the results that came from fasting. And I loved the the pleasure I felt God gained from my sacrifice. And, um, and so I would pray and God would show me, he would show me visions of people receiving the Holy Ghost, my hands on their head, people receiving the Holy Ghost. And they were not saints. These were sinners. Uh, I had visions of baptizing gigantic athletes in the swimming pool at our college. I had visions of this while I was praying. I had visions of us dancing on the sidewalks of our college. And these visions were in stark contrast to the reality that I found myself in when I was actually going out in public. I wouldn't say a word to anybody. I wouldn't witness to anybody. I would pray for hours before I would ever go. But when I would get in public, the spirit of fear would come upon me and it would absolutely bind me from head to toe. I couldn't talk, couldn't relate, couldn't do anything. And so I became sort of a monk on campus and a monk in my neighborhood. I just couldn't talk to people. And and the, the voice that came to me, the words that came to me said, if you open your mouth, you'll be rejected. If you try to witness, you won't have the right words. Just one thing after another. Your lifestyle is too extreme. No, People may want Christianity, but they don't want your version of Christianity. Nobody wants holiness. Uh, and, and once they start digging into what makes you different, they're going to be driven off and want some other version of Christianity. And that was a big one. Our holiness lifestyle. The devil told me that our holiness lifestyle was a major obstacle to evangelism. And then I begin to study scriptures on what evangelism looked like, the act of evangelism looked like in scripture. And, you know, we are called... Pentecostal, we are called apostolic Pentecostal. The reason why we're called Pentecostal is because we uh, conform to the paradigm. We have a similar experience, the exact same experience as the New Testament believers had on the day of Pentecost as recorded in Acts chapter two. We are called Pentecostal because we act like they act. We experienced what they experienced. We believe what they said. And there's no distinction between us now and those New Testament believers 2,000 years ago. That's why we're called Pentecostal. So it's not a denomination. It's a reflection of the reality of Scripture I've heard it said, you know, there's, 
There's the Reformation churches. There's the Protestant churches, the Reformation churches. Uh, We are not a part of the Reformation churches. We are a part of the Transformation church. We are not Reformation paradigm. We are Transformation paradigm. And when you look at the very first outpouring of the Holy Ghost in Scripture, as recorded in Acts chapter 2, the Bible says, this is Acts 2 and 1, the day of Pentecost was fully come. They were all with one accord in one place. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven. I want to give you a backdrop here. They were there for 10 days. So Jesus, after he rose from the dead, he appeared to them for 40 days, um, showing that he was alive with many infallible proofs, being seen of them 40 days, speaking of them, speaking to them of the prophecies. And, and then finally, on day 40, he's gathered with his disciples and he says, go tarry in Jerusalem. Acts, Acts 1 records this. Go tarry in Jerusalem. Wait for the promise of the Father. You've heard about it. You're going to be endued with power from on high. You shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, unto all uh, other, the uttermost part of the earth. And, and so he's leaving. And now he didn't tell him it would be the day of Pentecost. He didn't tell him, wait 10 days. He just said, go wait, go tarry. And so they go for 10 days. They go to Jerusalem and they, they, I believe they prayed. Um, they definitely did some business, some uh, political business. They voted on a new apostle, which is hilarious to me that they, they did that. They voted on Matthias because Judas was gone. He was dead, and, and Peter waxed eloquent talking about Judas, and now we need someone to take his place, uh, his bishopric, shall another man uh, fill that, fill that spot, take his place. And so they voted, they voted on Matthias, they cast lots and that's cast lots. And that's the first time you hear about Matthias. And, and that's the last time you hear about Matthias. Uh, you never hear about him again in entire scripture. And then Paul came along and Paul had to fight for that spot that man did not give to him, but Jesus gave to him. Paul, an apostle, not of man, but of Jesus Christ, but of God and the will of God not of the will of man. How many times did he say that? Not by the will of man, but by the will of God. And he said, I'm, I'm laying a foundation. He's going to sit on one of those 12 thrones, which were on the 12 foundations in the new Jerusalem. So Paul took that spot. So they took care of business. They prayed. They, they stayed together. They were all with one accord in one place. No doubt they prayed, waiting. And then 10 days after the disappearance of Jesus Christ into the clouds, Acts chapter 2 when the day of Pentecost was fully come. The power of God came on them and, and they were all with one accord in one place. They were unanimous in their passion. They were unanimous in their focus. The spirit of God came upon them and they all were filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with, with tongues as the spirit gave them the utterance. And it's wonderful. There was about 120 people there. They all got the Holy Ghost at one moment. And then something unmentioned happens. Something undefined happens. Something even more unexpected happens. It goes from them receiving the Holy Ghost in verse 4 to talking about who was outside the building in verse 5. It talks about them receiving that power in verse 4, and then it talks about the city they were in in verse 5. And it goes and and, and now all of a sudden, it was noise abroad. Verse 6, the multitude came together, were confounded because that every man heard them speak in his own language. At some point, they left the upper room. And this is what God showed me. They did not change their behavior when they left the upper room. They didn't transform when they walked out of the door of the upper room into the streets of Jerusalem, they did not stop being what they were behind closed doors. They were going nuts, speaking in tongues. They had no clue what they were saying. These were not tongues for interpretation. These were not tongues for interpretation. These were the initial evidence of the Holy Ghost Speaking in tongues, that is also recorded in Acts chapter 8, Acts chapter 10, Acts chapter 19. Every time somebody was baptized, filled with the Spirit of God, 
with the Holy Ghost, they spoke with other tongues, not for interpretation, but as the evidence of the infilling of the Holy Ghost as recorded in Mark 16. Believers shall speak with new tongues, as recorded in James, that James said the tongue is unruly. James 3, it's unruly. It's full of deadly poison. And, and just like the rudder, the little rudder controls the massive ship, the little tongue controls the body. Uh, just like the little bridle controls that big, powerful horse, so the tongue controls the body. And he said, so is the tongue a little member, but it kindles a great fire. It's set on fire of hell. And, and what is he saying? When God takes over your life, he shows you he's taken over by taking over the rudder of the ship. He shows you he's taken over by taking over the one thing we will never have control over, our tongue. So every time somebody got the Holy Ghost, they spoke with tongues. There's no other paradigm in Scripture for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. You can go to the epistles where it talks about being saved, but it never records the moment of saving. You have to go to the Acts, the history of the apostles, to record the actual moments where people were filled with the Holy Ghost. And you'll find there was always the outward, visible, audible sign of speaking in tongues. And so this happened. It's happening inside of the building, and now somebody got the bright idea to go outside of the building. And they didn't change their demeanor. That's what stood out to me from Jesus Christ himself. He said, there is no change in their behavior, in their demeanor, they didn't stop speaking in tongues when they went outside of the door of the church house. They kept on speaking in tongues and they kept on acting the fool and they kept on acting drunk in the Holy Ghost. Now, this is in stark contrast to 2024 American Pentecostalism. Absolutely. Absolutely stark contrast. We come to church. We're a bunch of hypocrites. We come to church. We lay hands on each other. Hopefully you have churches like that. Hopefully that's the church you're familiar with. But, but we lay hands on each other. We speak in tongues. We prophesy. We run the aisles. We roll. We scream hallelujah. Why? Because we're in a Pentecostal safe place. We know we're not going to be judged. And so we are very actively Pentecostal. But as soon as the preacher says, you are dismissed, we then calm ourselves down. Even if we have to stay on a pew for a while and breathe deeply, we calm that Holy Ghost down so we can walk outside of the doors and become acceptable to the world we're surrounded by. Woo! And the Lord showed me that was not the case the day the church was born. There was no distinctive change in their spirit their intensity, their behavior, and the miracle happening in their mouth, the speaking in tongues. And so when they, when they went out there, there were people that they were, the Bible says they were devout men, Jews out of every nation. So they were devout, and there were two subgroups in that devout. Some people are devout, and they're full of unbelief, and they're mockers. Other people are devout, and they say, what meaneth this? Verses 12 and 13. What's going on here? Please explain to me what's happening. The other group said, these are drunk. These men are full of new wine. And so, so I want you to understand the evangelism strategy of Jesus Christ, the law of first mention, the evangelism strategy of Jesus Christ was to get the saints so full of the Holy Ghost that they lost their identity, they lost their dignity, they lost their sophistication, their composure, they lost their language, they lost their ability to even control their coherence, hence being labeled drunk. Get them to that place where they are so full of the spirit and then get them outside and let them act outside like they were just acting inside. My God. Now, <clears throat> not only was this happening, they were speaking in tongues. And now, again, these were not tongues for in, uh, interpretation. These were tongues that were being translated, but not supernaturally. 
These were not supernaturally translated tongues. Some of the people, some of that group of the 120 people in that upper room were speaking in uh, tongues that could be understood by the Parthians. Some people were speaking in the Median tongue. Some people were speaking in the Elamite tongue. Some people were speaking in the Mesopotamian tongue, the Cappadocian tongue, the tongue of Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt. And, and, and verse 11 sums it up. Crete, the Cretan tongue, the Arabian tongue. We do hear them speak in our tongues, the wonderful works of God. So these are Jews who are bilingual. They speak Hebrew. They probably speak multilingual. They probably speak Aramaic, but they also speak the pagan language of the country that they are from. They are not native to Judea. They are not native to Jerusalem. And so when these freshly minted Pentecostals came out of the upper room, they were speaking Cretan, Phrygian, Pamphylian, Egyptian, not supernaturally interpreted, but understood by the people that came from those areas. They understood the language. And this was the evangelism strategy of Jesus Christ, the first day of the church. First day of the church. Now, this was only one part of it. So this is a great miracle that's happening. And then verse 14, but Peter standing up with the 11 lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea. Now he's not speaking in tongues here. He's not speaking in a language he does not understand. He's not speaking in any of the pagan languages. He's speaking a language that commonly all of these different groups of people would understand. It's going to be either Aramaic or Hebrew. And he said, these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day, but this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel in the last days saith God, I will pour out of my spirit on all flesh. And it goes on and on and on. And so, so this, this is so vitally important because the voice that I have been fighting from the time I was a young man and, and, and all through evangelism and especially as a pastor, oh my goodness, there, there may be other pastors listening to this and and I got to tell you, I never faced this voice more profoundly until I started pastoring. When I started pastoring, this voice, even to this day, screams at me. And it doesn't sound like the devil. The devil never sounds like the devil. If the devil sounded like the devil, you would know it's the devil. You know, if there was some kind of snarl or blood dripping fangs in the voice, you would know that's the devil. The devil sounds like logic. The devil sounds like sort of a cynical version of common sense to me. And this voice would tell me, Joey, because when I preach and when I pray and when I worship, I want to lose my composure. I want to give up my image. The only way you see the image of Jesus is if you relinquish the, relinquish the image of Joey. That's the only way you get, you have to be willing to substitute your dignity to access his digni, de, deity. I butchered those two D words. You have to be willing to give up your dignity to have access to his deity. And so, so, I, I want to go beyond myself. I want to lose myself in prayer, lose myself in worship, lose myself in prayer, lose myself in preaching. And I'm watching myself and I'm watching the Reformation world, including other Pentecostals who have that Reformation spirit. And like, man, and that voice would tell me, if you're going to build a church in Palm Coast, you're going to have to calm things down. If you're going to get them, if you're going to win them, you're going to have to tone things down. You're going to have to put it in a pretty package. And I'll be honest with you, I fell prey to this. The first four weeks of pastoring, I had never faced the spirit on this level. And, and 
I'm like, well, what can I do? How can I keep their attention? And, but at the same time, not freak them out. And so I got into some leadership books and I began to teach the principles I found in leadership books and everybody enjoyed it so much. And so did the devil sitting in the audience and Jesus, he kind of looked in the door and went on to the next church. And, and so the, the staggering thing about this chapter in Acts, the book of Acts, is that they didn't have name tags. They weren't going around passing out flyers. They weren't going around giving people bottled water. And all that stuff's good, and we do all that. They weren't doing it at that point. They weren't, they weren't doing a street concert. Take the most Pentecostal service you can possibly imagine where everybody is talking in tongues and everybody is drunk in the Holy Ghost. I've never been in that level, honestly. I've been in some ma- an amazing Pentecostal services where maybe 90% of the people were talking in tongues and maybe about 30% of the people were drunk in the Holy Ghost. I've never been in a church service where everybody is in the spirit so much to where they're just drunk out of their minds. But take the most intense, astounding Pentecostal service you can possibly imagine and open the doors of the sanctuary and kick everybody into the most densely populated part of your city and don't change your behavior at all. Keep on laying hands on each other. Keep on screaming. Keep on rolling on the pavement. Keep on prophesying, keep on talking in tongues and don't worry about anybody or anything. Just keep doing it. That was God's evangelism strategy. And 3,000 people received the Holy Ghost because of it. My God, I I, I believe and I teach this and I have preached this. I believe it's a word from God. I trust it's a word from God. We have had every level of revival except Acts 2 revival. I'm not talking about numbers. Probably more people got the Holy Ghost in Acts 8 than did in Acts 2. Because the Bible says the whole city was converted. And the whole city with one accord gave heed to those things which Philip spake, both hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. The whole city, the entire city, the entire population, probably more than 3,000. But that paradigm we have, we have experienced. What is that? That's the paradigm of revival where we send our apostles into foreign territory. We've seen that. We've sent our apostles to foreign territory and thousands of people have received the Holy Ghost. Acts 2 is a different paradigm. Acts 2 is the local church paradigm. It's the local church. And this is a local church exiting their building full of the Holy Ghost and converting 3,000 people because of the power of God that's flowing down upon them. So it's exactly the opposite of what the devil says. It's not that we need to tone it down to have revival and harvest. It's that we need to turn it up to have revival and harvest. We don't need less aisle running. We need more aisle running. We don't need less holy rolling, which is where you roll on the floor. We used to be called holy rollers. I see less and less of that. I think we're can, we can be called head nodders, but I'm not sure we can be called holy rollers. We are amazing head nodders in 2024 Pentecost. We are the most amazing head nodders, and there's types of head nods. There's the chop. There's the pendulum. We, hit, we nod our head so much. Our head is on a swivel. Holy rolling, not so much. We don't need less holy rolling to have revival. We need more holy rolling. We need more people getting drunk in the Holy Ghost on Wednesday nights. We need more banshee screaming. 
We don't need to tone it down. God, deliver us from the lie. And the problem we are facing in our day is we're reading so many books, and I read them too. We're reading a book right now, reading several of them, where these men who are building churches are telling us how to do it and telling us how to present ourselves and telling us how to do our platforms and telling us how to do our smoke machines, telling us how to do our lights and telling us how to do our first impressions and telling us how to do our visitor follow-up. And we get put into this paradigm of Reformation church culture. And Jesus is uncomfortable in that culture. As a matter of fact, I would venture to say he rarely shows up in that culture. They're feeling goosebumps, but it's soulish realm. And that pressure is on us. Ooh, that pressure is on us. And so the devil speaks to us. You're too Pentecostal. You need to be more like this non-denominational church. People shouldn't be able to tell you apart until they really start picking apart your doctrine. And then finally, eventually, after much research, they'll finally come to the conclusion that you only baptize in Jesus' name and you only believe in one person who is God named Jesus. Let's let's do all the lights, the smoke, the cameras, the action, the presentation that the non-denominational churches are doing, except we will have this secret that they don't have that we will only reveal at the right time. Right time. It'll be bait and switch. Eventually, we'll let them know, hey, by the way, we're not like them. We're Jesus' name. What a bunch of absolute stupidity and nonsense. Total nonsense. And not a biblical paradigm of church growth evangelism, and apostolic revival. You're not going to find it. I'll never forget <clears throat> when I began to do um, campus ministry at what is now Central Florida College, I believe it's called. It was Central Florida Community College back then. There was maybe seven to 9,000 people went there. I was terrified. I was, as a student, I was terrified. We were able to win two people as a student, and that's, that's, I'm so thankful for that. They're still in church. Their families are in church. What a blessing. I felt like a failure because I had so many visions of what was going to happen at that campus, but I kind of forgot about it, went to the University of Florida, got my degree, came back and began to work at the church, and really against my will, one of my dear friends, Pastor Jason Varnum, told me, why don't you go try doing some campus ministry there again now that you're youth pastor? And so I was like, well, we already tried that, but went back there and God began to loose us. And it was at this time, kind of give you the background of this. Um, I was really, really desperate to win souls. I was really desperate to, to reach the lost. And I was living alone. I was single, had a lot of time to think. I think I was 27 or 28 at this time, maybe 29. And, um, I was trying to figure out how to reach all the kids. There's a ton of kids in my neighborhood. And I got this idea of going to the bus stops and giving them desserts because kids like chocolate. And that would get their attention. I didn't think of the implications of serial killer or kidnapper or anything like that. I just thought this would get their attention. The Lord sort of blinded me to common sense, I guess, in that area. But I had this old uh, 49cc Honda scooter gas-powered Honda scooter, man, and I got my box of fudge rounds. And under the inspiration of the Holy Ghost, I went to the stop sign where all the kids get off on the bus in my neighborhood, and I pulled up there, and as they were getting off, there was like eight kids. As they were getting off, um, I yelled to them. I held up the fudge rounds, and I yelled. And by this time, the Lord was really beginning to challenge me to break out of my comfort zone and break free from fear. Held up the box of fudge rounds and said, who wants a fudge round? And these kids literally like parted like the Red Sea. They came out of the bus and they just went around me and they were looking at me very alarmingly. And they, 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 they were taught well by their parents, I think, to avoid the person who's offering you treats randomly and wanting you to come closer, you know. And this little girl came off the bus and she looked at me and she's, she had no alarm or caution whatsoever. She was younger than everybody else. She's like, I want to find her out. 
And so I was like, okay, come on and get it. So I opened the box, gave her a fried and these other kids, I noticed they stopped going down the sidewalks and they sort of were watching her. I guess they were using her as a guinea pig. If she lived and was not poisoned and I did not attack her, then it might be worth the risk to eat a fudge round, a free fudge round. And she lived and so they all came over there and they were munching on fudge rounds and they were looking at me with adoration, love and companionship. And I, I said, hey, I made it up on the fly. I don't, I don't know if I recommend this or not, but I made it up on the fly. I said, hey, we do a kid's Bible study at my house on Monday nights uh, at 7.30 and there's gonna be fudge rounds and food and, and, and games, and we're gonna talk about Jesus. Go tell your parents, this Monday night at 7.30. And they're like, okay, and they went and, and disappeared. And a little bit later, I got a knock on my door, and it was a mama. And she's like, what's going on with you giving my kids chocolate and telling them to come over to your house Monday night at 7.30? And I think the alarms went off at that point. I needed to defi- define my mission a little bit more clearly. And I told her, I told her, I was like, look, I'm the youth pastor at Souls Harbor First Pentecostal Church. I'm just trying to serve our community. I want to bless these kids. There's so much going on and this is a safe place. And why don't you come as well and help? And, and she's like, absolutely, I'll come as well. She made these big old pans of nacho cheese, uh, like hamburger meat, nacho cheese, green onions. Folks, it was good. Soul winners get free food, by the way. And so they all came over there and there was like eight of them and God began to open this door to teach the kids in my neighborhood about Jesus. And, but there's like 40 kids in my neighborhood and I only had six or seven and I kept praying, how am I going to get these kids? How am I going to do it? And during this process, <clears throat> I was renovating, this was my first house. I was renovating this house and I had ripped all the, the wood out of the house, the old wood flooring, the, I ripped even the subfloor. It was all rotten and corroded. I ripped it up and I put it in a big, now I'm living in a neighborhood. This is a rural neighborhood, neighbors stacked on top of each other, but there was a stump in, in my front flower garden that I saw, I think it was on YouTube or something like that that if you build a big enough fire around a stump, it'll start you know, burning itself down. And so I got all the wood out of the house and I put it around this stump and built this fire. And the fire, you know, all these things had like chemicals on them, like, like polyurethane finish and other flammable stuff, combustible things. And when I lit this fire, it was like gigantic. And it was shriveling all the leaves on the other trees and the, the fascia on the house began to like make noises as it, as it, expanded. And I'm, I'm deeply concerned. The pillar of cloud from the new Testament was going up into the heavens and I'm getting my water hose. I'm trying to put this out. It is not going out. As I'm fighting this life-threatening blaze, one of the kids that came to Bible study, his name was Reynaldo from Puerto Rico. He comes running up the street and and I see him and he's got it. I, I cannot remember this for the life of me. I can't remember if it was an ice cream or a box of popcorn because some of the kids had that, but, but either he, he was one of them that had the ice cream or the popcorn. And I think it was an ice cream and he came running up the street and he's screaming to me. He's like, Oh, Pastor Capitelli, your house is on fire, dude. And I'm, I'm looking at, he's not offering a lick of help. He's just watching. He was like 11 years old. He's just watching, licking that ice cream. And other kids came running up the street. They're all coming out of their houses now. And they're gathering on my property line at the street, watching me battle, frantically battle this stump fire that is out of control. Then parents came out of their homes. And and then the fire trucks came. The siren came up the road. And when that happened, they're honking their horn. All the kids are cheering and the parents are now exiting their homes in earnest. It's a dramatic thing happening right next door to them. And they're all gathered. There are literally like 30 to 40 people gathered on the street in front of my house. Now, this was right before our vacation Bible school. And I'm battling this place. And the firefighters get out. By this point, I have it kind of soaked enough where it's, it's still burning, but it's under control. And the firefighters get out. And they have this look of, you have got to be kidding me. This guy's burning a stump. And... um I needed a, a baptism of common sense. But, but when I looked out, standing in front of this fire, 
everybody's just looking at me. There's like 40 people, including firemen, kids and parents looking at me. And the Holy Ghost came on me in that moment. And I lifted my hands and I said, can I have your attention? I said, this Thursday night, we are having our vacation Bible school at Souls Harbor Pentecostal Church. I'm the youth pastor and I'm giving free rides. We're bringing buses and vans. I made it all up on the spot. I just knew we had a bunch of minivans in the church that I could convince these people to use them to bring these kids. I said, we're going to have games and food and we're going to learn about Jesus and there's going to be music. It's going to be incredible. Who wants to come? And all the kids lifted their hands. And the parents were, by this point, several of the parents had been to the neighborhood Bible studies and they were just laughing. And I was able to bring 23 kids 23 or 26, I'm going to do the conservative 23, 23 kids to VBS. Many of them got the Holy Ghost. By the time it was all said and done, we had 17 people in our neighborhood baptized or filled with the Holy Ghost. And the next day I was in what was then Kmart. I don't even know if Kmart exists anymore. I think I was, I'm giving my age right now. I'm revealing my age. But in Kmart, my next, uh, the neighbor that was a few houses down across the street came up to me. He's like, hey, you're the guy with the stump fire. I was like, yeah. He's like, yeah, man, I called the fire department. The fire department gave me a ticket, by the way. He's like, I'm the one that called the fire department, man. I'm sorry, but it looked like your house is going down, man. I'm like, oh, it's okay. I'm like, hey, are your kids coming to VBS? Yeah, they're coming to VBS, and we want to be a part of your neighborhood Bible study. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. He said, Joey, if you ever learn to build a fire, people will come automatically. If you ever learn to build that fire, people will come automatically. All that nonsense that the devil's trying to get you to do to tone it down, the devil is more aware of the attractiveness of spirit fire than any being in the universe. And everything he can do to put a wet blanket on it, he's going to do. Because if you ever get the fire going, harvest is going to be automatic. Revival is going to be automatic. Church growth is going to be automatic. It's going to be automatic. Man, when we were in the heat, I hope I'm helping somebody today. Just kick this stinking spirit in the face. I'm so sick of sophisticated Pentecost. I see more blank stares in Pentecost than I've ever seen in my life. That was not the way it used to be, folks. My God, have mercy. Where are the aisle runners? Where are the, where are the people that come and they come all prayed up and ready to just get in the Holy Ghost? That we need that. We are not going to have end time apostolic harvest by just sending one apostle here and one apostle there. We need our churches on fire like Acts chapter 2 where we are the same whether we're behind the doors or in the streets. We need it desperately. In the midst probably of the most intense part of our campus ministry, God was... We, my wife and I went through this and, and I hope I'm being accurate. I'm trying to be accurate from what I can remember. We were able to baptize or see filled with the Holy Ghost about 50 people. And there's been others that have done way, way more. And I feel like we barely even touched a, a 7,000 to 9,000 student campus. But God did do some amazing things, and it, it became very popular on campus to get baptized in Jesus' name, and everybody was involved in it. We were the biggest club on campus, and we preached to all these students. We had the center stage. We, were, we had the most favor. Let me tell you something about the fire. When we first started campus ministry there, they hated our guts. They hated our guts. 
they wouldn't give us any finances. They wouldn't give us any nice rooms. They put us in this like tiny storage closet room with chairs stacked everywhere. Here, you can use this, fix it up. They were very mean. When we tried to get anything done at the Student Activity Center, they hated our guts. And we prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted and prayed and fasted. And God fired every one of those jokers and replaced them with people that absolutely thought we were the greatest thing since sliced bread. They gave us more money than any club on campus. They gave us the biggest room on campus. They gave us all the technology we wanted on campus. They gave us the huge auditorium whenever we wanted it. We had symposiums. We had professors. We had preachers come in and talk about we had all kinds of stuff. And, and, and it was all paid for by the college. God gave us favor. And, and I remember preaching, and we've had other people come out there and preach. I remember preaching out on the, the center lawn of the campus, standing up on the pillar, telling everybody about Jesus and just baptizing one kid after another in, in the baptisms at the local church the campground that was there, the Ocala campground, and also uh, baptizing them in the swimming pool. We shut down a, a, a swim meet. We, the, the lady that ran the pool, the student, she loved us and she would let us in. It was illegal, but she would let us in. You want to baptize people in Jesus' name? Absolutely, get in here. And so one particular meeting, they were having their, their college swim competition. And there was a lane at the very end of the pool that wasn't being used. And I didn't know, I, I, not, not until I looked in the bleachers did I realize this was like a school event going on. And we went all the way down to the end to this open lane. We just kind of waved at everybody and, and they were watching us and we weren't really stopping anything and they kept going. And I'm telling you the truth, these swimmers were on their, like the blocks they stand on. I don't even know what they're called, but they were like getting ready to jump and swim. And we went down to this final lane that was open and we had, I believe, two young men, young students to get baptized in Jesus' name. And when he got in the water, he had a, we, we took off, he took off his dry clothes, put on one of our baptismal robes. So he's in this green burlap robe. And I look and every single person in this swim amphitheater in the bleachers, on the blocks, the coaches, the rest, they have stopped what they're doing and they are looking at us and they're thinking, I don't know what they were thinking, but they stopped and we baptized this kid in front of everybody loudly in the name of Jesus Christ, prayed for him, got him out, walked out, and then they continued their swim meet. You want to talk about favor. And in the midst of this process, one of the most powerful men on the campus wanted to have a meeting with me. And he brought me into his meeting. And this man had already seen Jesus' name baptism. He had already said he wanted to get rebaptized in Jesus' name, but the devil was fighting so hard with his tradition, and he was, he was struggling. And his spirit changed, and I saw it change, and he wanted to meet with me. And so I went there. We were having lunch. And he began to tell me, he said, you know, it's amazing what, what's happening with this club. It's the biggest club that's ever been on this campus. You've got everybody on board. Uh, it's the biggest thing happening. And he said, you're an amazing teacher. You must have been studying from the time you were born, which he didn't understand. The spirit of truth will lead you and guide you into all truth. People that have the Holy Ghost have an, have an extra insight to scripture because they know the author. And that's what he was feeling. And, and he said, he said the, the thing we need to do to take this to the national level, he said, I want to take this to the college campuses of America. I want to package your material. I want to make a curriculum out of your messages. And we want to get you to spread this. I'll send you all over the United States, the college campuses, to Christian clubs, and you can package this material. And he began to list some names of people that he had helped write material and give them, I'm talking big time names. One of them was Joel Osteen. So whether he was lying through his teeth, I know not, but it sure seemed like he was telling the truth. <laughs> and he said, but there's really, there's just one tweak there's just one tweak that we need to do with your material. Every time you teach your material, you talk about repentance. 
And you talk about this baptism in Jesus' name, and you talk about this infilling of the Holy Ghost with speaking in tongues. He said, if we could just sort of package that better and make that a little less offensive, he said, we could take your material all over the United States of America. And man, that was the attempt of the enemy to shut down the fire. And I hadn't faced that on that level until I started pastoring. When I pastor, it's the same thing. If you could just package your message a little bit better to be more ambiguous, preach about ambiguous principles, preach about what would John Maxwell preach about? What would, what would the, the big name denominational preachers preach about? Well, they would preach about faith. They would preach about spiritual things, the gifts of the spirit and love and, and the fruit of the spirit. And all that stuff is Bible. It's all Bible. But there's a way to preach Bible without preaching Bible, without ever having a confrontation of the truth. And the devil speaks to me every single time I get in the pulpit. His voice is becoming smaller and smaller because I'm just, I'm not going to tolerate it anymore. And I've found the lie. God has exposed the lie. If you could just be more ambiguous, the crowds would come. And I've had people, people tell me, if you could just calm things down at Christian Life Center, we would have a bigger crowd. Now, this is just like one or two people in five years. And uh, God bless them. They, they need to, you know. But that spirit was speaking through them. If we could just package this better, it's a lie. What kind of package was the day of Pentecost? What kind of package was that? I'll tell you what kind of package it was. It was a Holy Ghost package. And it was an either you want this or you don't want this. And if you don't want this, God bless you. I hope one day you do, but I'm going to people who do want this. This only works on the hungry and the thirsty. And every preacher, every man of God, and especially every pastor will have to decide who he's going to preach to, what type of church he's going to preach to. You're either going to preach to the church that wants it pretty or you're going to preach to the church that wants it powerful. And if you preach to the church that wants it pretty, the church that wants it powerful will never gain momentum in your church. But if you preach to the people who want it powerful, the people who want it pretty will get mad at first, but then God will either convert them or get them out and your church will be powerful. That is the absolute paradigm of scripture. Are we too Pentecostal? Can you be too Pentecostal? I don't know that we've reached the level of Acts 2 yet. And the spirit that was on David, I feel is available to whomsoever will right now. When Michael saw David dancing the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, she despised him in her heart. And when he came in to bless his house, she said to him, what a fool you made of yourself in public. And David said, it wasn't for you whose household God has rejected. It was unto the Lord. And this is the spirit I'm talking about. And I will be more vile than thus. And I will be base in my own sight. I want to ask you a question. When's the last time you were base in your own sight? When's the last time you had a church service where that shirt, you know that church service is going to look stupid on live stream. Man, and we got to have both, and I got to give a disclaimer here. You can't just have all not, you know, we're not trying to be obnoxious. We're not trying to be crazy. We're not trying to be in your face. We're trying to be apostolic Pentecostal. And then there's got to be somebody like Peter that says, this is that. Let me explain what's going on here. Why are these people acting like this? This is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Can you be too Pentecostal? I don't think so. 
I think what this world needs right now is someone that is thoroughly oneness, apostolic, Pentecostal, unashamedly, without inhibition or fear, that recognizes that old-fashioned separation and holiness is not an obstacle to revival, but an opportunity for revival. That's what we need. And we need to smack that spirit in the face. I encourage you, don't tone it down. Tune it up. Turn it up. Put on the afterburners on that worship, on your voice being lifted, on your hands being raised, on speaking in other tongues boldly and loudly. Let me tell you something. I'll tell you what happened. Those visions came to pass of baptizing those high school athletes in the swimming pool. Those visions of dancing on the sidewalks at a public university came to pass. I'll never forget the first person that got the Holy Ghost in a meeting on campus. She got the Holy Ghost talking in tongues right at that table. And we burst out of that room and ran out of the room and started dancing and screaming hallelujah, violently dancing on the sidewalks of that university. Why not? Everybody else seems to violently dance on the public universities. I'll tell you what the Holy Ghost told me, and this, I think this will be the last thing I say, but I was, in, I was preaching in Toronto, Canada, and it was during their Gay Pride Festival. We have a backup recording of this, correct? We will. Okay, good. And, and they were dancing in the street, unashamedly holding signs. This is who we are. This is what we believe. We're coming for your children. We're coming for your school curriculum. They're dancing naked, painted in the streets, unashamedly showing the world who they are. And they're praised. And the devil tells Pentecostals, you better hide who you are, otherwise you will not be accepted. And I was in Toronto during this time. I was looking down from my hotel room. They had blocked off streets. And I was ticked because it was, the church was literally right over there across the road. We had to do this 30-minute detour to come around all the barricades where they were literally cordoning off these sections of the city so these people could manifest the spirit that they are of. And I told Jesus in that hotel, I said, God, I am so sick of these demonstrations in the streets. I'm so sick of it. And we're hiding in our buildings. And the Holy Ghost spoke right back to me. He said, if my people would dance in the streets, the sinners would hide in their buildings. Well, that's fanatical, Brother Campitella. That's off. Well, don't read Acts chapter two because that's exactly what they were doing. They were dancing in the streets, not in just some random rural street. They were dancing in downtown Jerusalem, unashamedly speaking in tongues. Could care less, could care less what anybody thinks about them. They had been filled with the Spirit, and they're going to heaven. Can you be too Pentecostal? I don't think so. I think we need more Pentecostal. I don't like the new version of Pentecost, y'all. It's powerless. It is so powerless. And we need Holy Ghost enhancers. We need a lot of Holy Ghost enhancers for this new version of Pentecost. We need smoke machines. We need lasers and lights in atmospheric conditions. Let me tell you what set the atmosphere for the fire on the day of Pentecost. Ten days of unrelenting unity, prayer, and focus. Now we have ten minutes of focus. So we need all the Holy Ghost enhancers. And the devil's clapping seated, seated in those, those venues. Come on. We need more Pentecost. You can't be too Pentecostal. It's what the world needs. I hope this was a blessing to you. I feel like I just wanted to smack this thing today. And uh, God... God is, and I hope wherever you are, who I've been getting so many texts um, in secret, and I'm thankful for that. Um, thank you for the support, and I appreciate all of it. And uh, wherever you find yourself, whatever church, whatever state you're in, whatever country you're in, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that a fresh baptism of Pentecostal fire will consume you and get you out of your building and show the world what you are in private. That's what we need in this last day. 
We're going back to the beginning for the grand finale. We're headed back to the very beginning for the grand finale of the church on earth. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. We're going to look like that when Jesus comes. I believe it with all my heart. God bless you. Thank you for tuning in to Christian Life Broadcast. Have a great week and uh, be more Pentecostal than you've ever been in your life. In Jesus' name, God bless you.